Listen in this inspired insider.com interview with Corbett Barr, founder of Think Traffic. What big mistake did he make with his first product? Listen up so you don't do the same thing with yours. Also, what happened in his first big startup that ended up collapsing? What did he do in his current business? What he learned from the past that makes his success and allows him to travel six months out of the year. And also at the end, listen, what did he see over and over when he listened to his audience? That and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Corbett Barr. Corbett is the founder of Think Traffic that helps online entrepreneurs build thriving audiences. He has several blogs and courses which are visited by over 200,000 people every month. That's amazing. He travels about six months out of the year while managing his multiple six-figure online businesses. I wish I had that, Corbett. That sounds great. <laughs> no, he's going to talk to us about top advice that he has, big lessons he learned from roadblocks and mistakes, because we often learn our most valuable lessons and go on to achieve success after we make some of those mistakes and learn from them. Corbett, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And I always like to include a fun fact, and one fun fact about Corbett is, while in college, he actually worked for the police, and once had a woman come after him when he was just an IT guy, and it has actually stood a couple feet from, from serial killers. So. So he's toughened. He's ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask is, what's um, you know, find out some of those mistakes that you made. What's one mistake you've made when talking about like a product? Well, uh, the biggest mistake I made with my current business, I think, is just waiting too long to release my first product. Um, there's this mental game that you play with yourself as an entrepreneur every day. And this is especially true when you're working by yourself, when you're a solo entrepreneur. Um, you know, essentially every day you're reevaluating your entire purpose for being, uh, the business that you're going into, uh, everything that you've done up till that point and everything that you've been planning to do. For some reason, all this flashes through your head like every day as an entrepreneur and you're questioning yourself. Um, and you can get stuck in a very serious rut where you decide to create a product and you start working on it and then a couple of weeks later you think it's a dumb idea and you don't know what you were thinking and you stop. Um, for my first product I did this for sadly uh, about 15 months it took me to release my first product. I was blogging and I was working with clients um, but my ultimate goal wasn't to be a service provider. I wanted to create and sell information products and, and maybe even software. And um, it just, it ended up taking me over a year to get through my first product. And, and even once I started working on it in earnest, there was probably eight or nine months that went by. Um, and I actually just quit in the middle of it. And luckily I had some friends that eventually, you know, talked me into continuing with it and it ended up being a big success. But, you know, the typical inner monologue was that it was a dumb idea, that nobody was gonna buy it and you just end up being paralyzed with fear about what to do. So initially, when you thought it was the best idea ever, what, what made you go and change your mind and think it was a dumb idea? Like, wh where'd that self-talk come in? I don't know, I mean, I think um, it's easy as an entrepreneur to get really excited in the beginning. You know, we always have this flash of, oh my God, this could be the coolest thing ever, and you sit down and start working on it that night. You know, you sketch out a bunch of stuff, and. You know, um, and wake up the next day maybe and think, oh, that was silly. Or maybe you actually start working on it. And then over time, you know, you start to hit little roadblocks um, along the way. There's just a whole lot of obstacles. Things aren't, you know, usually as easy as you hoped they might be. And that enthusiasm, you know, that you had on day one isn't enough to just propel you along. So, you know, you really have to trust, you know, in that in that planning part of yourself that decided this was a good thing to do and see it through till the end because you're not going to get any rewards if you if you work on something 90% of the way and don't release it you wasted all of that time you know so um, for me I think you know it just ended up being a process of 
doubting that anybody was going to buy it, thinking that there were better opportunities out there, being afraid of putting something out there and having it judged by the real world, you know? Yeah. So who, how did they prompt you to finally do it? What did they say to you? Well, um, you know, it's a little bit of outside perspective can be really huge. For me, I ended up in a mastermind group, which is a fancy term for a few guys who meet every week and talk about business stuff and try to hold each other accountable. Um, so I was in a mastermind group and, you know, what you talk yourself out of be, for these really big logical reasons from an outsider's perspective can be really silly. You know, somebody else can look at it and say, that's dumb. You're 90% of the way done. You knew this was a good idea to begin with, or you thought it was. Nothing has really changed except you're afraid. So finish it up, see how it goes, and then make a decision based on that. Don't just quit now and, and start something new. You'll never get anything done that way. Yeah. No, that's, that, that is so important to know because that goes inside all of our heads at some point. Yeah. Um, what's another mistake that you've made um, in the past, maybe with a company that you started? Yeah, so um, this is one of the biggest problems in building businesses in general, and I think that is not having enough um, intimacy or closeness with your customer. So in my first big startup, and this is big as in, you know, I live in San Francisco and we raised venture capital. Uh, we built a prototype and, and raised venture capital based on an idea um, and worked on it for a few years and ultimately it ended up collapsing and I, I left and went on sabbatical and changed my whole, you know, entrepreneurial journey at one point. Um, but, you know, the reason that startup failed and the reason that a lot of startups fail, I think, is that we started with an idea and built that idea without any input from the customers, without releasing something to the customers. And then when we did release something to the customer, we didn't listen to each individual person. We didn't get to know customers. We didn't ask them what they thought about the product. We didn't watch them use it. We simply sat on our pedestal up on high, knowing that we had such a brilliant idea, put it out there, and then watched metrics instead of listening to actual customers. And this is a big problem. When you aggregate all of your customers into metrics, like how many people signed up, how long are they using it for, how many people are converting, all this kind of stuff, you don't actually understand any behavior. You don't understand whether or not you're solving a legitimate problem for people. And if you're close to solving a problem, a lot of times, you know, you may have put something out there and there's a piece of it that's really useful. But if you don't break down the customer feedback and actually ask questions and survey people and get to know them, then you don't really get a whole lot of valuable stuff. And this is a huge mistake that, that I feel we made. Um, and we could have been really close because we had customers, we had people using the software. It just wasn't, you know, we just didn't reach out and, and say, hey, Bob, like, thanks for using this. Tell us what you think about it. We'd love your detailed feedback and like actually listen to people and find out, you know, what the use cases were. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. And that's so important and essential. And but also on the other side of it, you guys have probably really smart people working on the product. Right. And they're using it and they think they know and maybe reaching out to customers thinking, well, the customers don't really may not know what we what they want. We may know. What was it like when you were testing it? Um, internally with the team what kind of valuable stuff did you get or maybe you missed the mark where you thought it was valuable well I mean a big red flag <clears throat> should have been that we as a team I mean didn't necessarily love the software either you know it wasn't something that we felt like we had to have necessarily it didn't solve a problem in a really concrete way um, so that should have been a red, big red flag for me I think you know my uh, partner felt like it was a really great idea and he was sort of driving the vision um, and sometimes that vision that you have as an entrepreneur can feel so precious that if you let customers challenge that idea and say that it's not exactly what they need you can feel like you know they're challenging you personally right um, so I, I see both sides to that I mean I think you know you do have to have a stance as an entrepreneur and you have to have some gut and you have to filter the customer feedback but to simply shut out your customers and think that you know everything I think that's the number one mistake that that businesses make right do you remember a feature from that product that the team thought this is gonna be amazing and then didn't get traction or people didn't like it yeah well the, the product itself was this was a um, an email prioritization tool ultimately, but 
the concept it was based on was an academic paper that um, proved academically that if you introduce some sort of monetary barrier to email, that spam wouldn't exist. So if an unsolicited sender had to pay in order to reach you, spam essentially wouldn't exist. That feature never caught on. It, it got a lot of attention and we got major press from it, but that feature never caught on. Um, users simply were uncomfortable about it. Um, you know, businesses weren't willing to pay it. Um, it just it just didn't work out, and that and we spent you know years essentially many many months maybe years of effort working to build that that feature. We built other features as well that were used, but that was the kind of thing that um, you know we spent a lot of time working on and not really t talking to customers. And when we did talk to people, it was sort of theoretical, talking with advisors about the theory behind it, not talking to an actual customer and saying, "Here's this thing, you know, will you use this?" And if not, why? And if we did get feedback, um, you know, you talked about this filter. You know, it's it's easy to get customer feedback and then to discount them and say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're just users. Well, users are the reason that a business exists. So, um, you know, maybe there's some sort of nuance and fine line to it in terms of how much of that customer feedback you take. But you have to take some. Yeah, yeah. So transitioning from, you know, some of the big mistakes where, you know, just ship the product get rid of the self-talk of being too afraid and you know listening to your customers what's a big milestone that you're especially proud of and how you did things differently to reach that so you know we talked about um, this lack of you know closeness with the customer um, in my new business I basically went about it the opposite way there's there's sort of a couple of things that have to exist in a business there's the problem that you're solving there's the product or service that you create that solves that problem. And then there's the audience or group of people that have the problem to begin with. Well, a lot of startups start from the product side. You know, They identify the problem and start creating a product to solve it. And then when it gets close to ready, they go look for the audience, right? And that's sort of what we did in my past startup. Right. In this new go around, essentially, I started talking with people before I had any idea what product I was going to create. I just started blogging, started you know, having conversations with myself and with people that were tuning into my blog, and um, really started nurturing those relationships and fostering those conversations and asking people what they were struggling with and having conversations about these different problems. And that ultimately is what has led to the audience that I serve now, which at the opening you mentioned, you know, I have 200,000 people every month tuning into my blogs and um, you know using our various products that we've created and I attribute that basically to switching the focus from product first to audience first then product yeah I mean in a lot of people may be starting out and maybe you know they're wondering what input to take what was early on something that an audience member told you that really influenced it you're like wow this this they hit it on the head that's what i should be kind of focusing on well um the the way that you find out as you mentioned before like you can ask you can ask audience members customers what they want and they'll tell you some stuff and what mm -hmm. they say they want doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to buy so what i learned from most was actually creating products and putting them out there or services and seeing if people took me up on them, even to the point where um, maybe I would create something, an idea for a service and then offer it for free to begin with, or maybe have a contest, say I'm going to give away 10 of these packages to the people that leave comments below or whatever. It's a great way to you know gauge interest and then to actually go through the process of delivering that service to see if you might ultimately want to create a product or something bigger out of it. Um, one thing in general, you know, I thought in the beginning that there was this sort of need for a um, career coach in, in some sort of way, or not career, but entrepreneur, entrepreneurial coach, basically somebody who, you know, helped people think through what they knew, what expertise they had to try to come up with a business idea from it. What I found was that when I put myself in that coach position, I ended up being a little bit more of a psychiatrist than I wanted to be. Um, and I think that was because I focused it sort of on, you know, the overall picture. I was I was really talking about lifestyle businesses. And so people had this really great desire to live, you know, the lifestyle that they wanted. They knew that, but they had zero clue about the business end of it. And these two things, having the life and business kind of wrapped up together, 
just made it a little bit too personal, a little bit too much about their life and, and their struggles and not so much about the business side of things, which was what I really wanted to help with. So, you know, it kind of depends on how you put things out there, but um, you know, that helped me scrap that entire service idea and, uh, and pursue something differently. Yeah, so just telling the audience, be more specific you know, don't don't put like a general thing like. Well, yeah, and and, and maybe actually uh, changing the way that you approach the audience. So the you know the the way that I presented that service, just saying that it was you know um, lifestyle business coaching, you know um, that opened the door to people who really hadn't had you know anything figured out, and were just at this struggling sort of personal you know uh, stage where I wanted. To work with people that had, you know, a little bit more of an idea of what business they wanted, so that the things that I could help them with were marketing and branding and business things. So the way that you talk to your audience about the product or service that you're creating can have a big impact on who approaches you. So what's one thing that did work really well for you when you started listening to the audience? Well, um, one thing that I saw over and over again. So you know, I started out blogging um, about these ideas of career and life and how the two integrated together and that led me down a path but as I found you know as I mentioned I found that there were a lot of people who just didn't have their own personal shit together pardon my French and um, weren't really to the business stage yet but as I saw people who were a little bit further along and had a business idea and were trying to build an audience around it I just saw a lot of people who were struggling to build an audience and a question that came up over and over again was how do I grow an audience for this idea that I have right so um, it just became clearer and clearer to me that that was something that I had experience with that was something that people were struggling with and I kind of met the two in the middle with this new concept with this blog that I have called think traffic um, which is really just about you know we asked a question why do some sites attract a massive audience while most go basically unnoticed and we just asked that question and try to provide answers to it all the time and um, and that's you know that was a major breakthrough for me yeah and your blog is great I've read many of the posts, so everyone who, if you're not one of the 200,000 people who haven't checked it out, check it out. So, um, so, you know, Corbett, what is, I wanted to find out also one of the best pieces of advice that you'd want to give to business owners um, that they should definitely use. Well, um, I mean, I think I've said it already, and for me, it's customer intimacy. It's getting to know your customers, and I don't mean from a profile standpoint, you know, like a, a general, you know, imagining like what an avatar is. type of thing. Avatar. Yeah. I mean, that's useful. You have to start somewhere if you don't have anyone to talk to. But if you're putting content out there, um, blog posts, if you're putting uh, videos out there, that sort of thing, and and getting people to subscribe, you know, to to learn about your content, then you have some connection with those people, and you can you can take things a step further. Um, you can respond to commenters and say, hey, thanks so much for commenting. I really appreciate it. What attracted to you, you to my blog? What else do you read? What are you struggling with right now? That sort of thing. And really start having conversations, literal conversations with individual people to get to know what their perspective is, um, to talk to them about the problem domain, and to really um, get to know the problem better than you know it yourself. Because you'll find out that you know you think there's this problem out there, but the way that you approach it um, and your skill sets and, and what you've gone through, your struggles are different than everyone else's. And maybe if you can adapt a couple of other things that people struggle with, um, you're going to make your, your solution to that problem a lot stronger. Yeah. And I find too, the point you made too, like with your blog, like you actually respond to people. Like a lot of times if you go on a blog and leave a comment, you don't get that two way conversation. So you feel like you're, it's kind of throwing it out there. And one thing I noticed about, um, you know, your blogs is there is a response. And also when I sign up for, I, you know, again, I don't get a commission or anything, but I would say go sign up for their newsletter. It's great information. And when you sign up, like the first email you get is like, what are you struggling with? And you, yeah. you actually ask that question and there's someone there kind of engaging you. So yeah, I could see that right off the bat that you have that right on from the first email you send out to people. Yeah, that's go I mean, encouraging those conversations, like most people ha take this approach of, I hate email, I don't want people emailing me. Well, the customer feedback and interaction is gold. Like what, you know, why does your business exist if not to serve customers? Eventually, when you have hundreds of thousands of people tuning in, 
maybe it'll become a burden and you can stop asking so many questions because you have a better handle on it. But in the beginning, you need to treat each relationship as if it's you know gold. It's your only customer. It's your only lead on a customer at this point. You really need to serve those people um, and treat yourself as a resource for solving whatever problems your customers have. Yeah. And I've... I have one last question for you before I ask it. I just want you to tell us a little bit more about your business and what you're excited about right now. Well, uh, the thing I'm most excited about, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but I have a, a new platform called Fizzle. And Fizzle is essentially a combination of a uh, business video training library combined with a really vital community. So there's two things that entrepreneurs struggle with. It's it's knowledge and know-how, you know, just learning the nuts and bolts, the things that you need to do, and then also having support from other people that are going through the same thing. I talked earlier about how I was in a mastermind group and these people, you know, talked me into creating my first product and stopped me from talking myself out of it. Um, it's really easy to quit if you don't have other people there that are examples and that are sort of rooting for you and pulling you along the way. So at Fizzle, we have this community of people um, that are working to slay their own dragons, to solve their own problems, and helping each other out and working together within the platform, but also forging you know relationships and bonds and friendships outside. You know, they're talking on the phone, they're having Google Hangouts, they're doing all of these things to help each other in their entrepreneurial journey because that self-talk and that you know emotional roller coaster that you're on as an entrepreneur is a very real thing and most of the time you're not going to get a whole lot of support from your family and friends because they're probably doing you know other types of uh, careers and they don't necessarily understand what you're going through so one of the best ways that you can you know ensure your success is to connect with other people who are trying to do the same thing so we do that in fizzle and combine that with a library of training from experts um, people that you might know of uh, people like leo babauta teaches a course on engaging content um, pat flynn teaches a course on affiliate marketing all of these people who have been successful in their businesses teach an area that they're particularly good at in courses in Fizzle with um, videos and workbooks and things that entrepreneurs can go through. Plus, you guys have fun. The production Plus, we try to have fun. Yeah, like what I've noticed from the videos, you guys just, you know, you're joking around and you have fun with it. Yeah, that's something that's sorely lacking in business. I mean, there's a lot of serious stuff to talk about, but it just makes it so much easier if you have a little bit of fun with it. And um, we try not to take ourselves too seriously. So what's the craziest thing you guys have done while producing one of the Fizzle videos? We have uh, we have a lot of fun behind the scenes. We actually have some bloopers and things that we try to take um, just to kind of show people what's going on behind the scenes. But you know, even while we're shooting, um, there's plenty of stuff. Uh, my partner Chase is uh, pretty crazy. I don't know if you've encountered him much, but um, he could probably be a comedian as much as he can be an entrepreneur, and he brings that to fizzle. So um, I don't know. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of just. We try to break down the walls and have real conversations with people, not this, you know, I'm a business robot and right. here are my, you know, rote answers. It's hard though because there's a fine line. You want them to, like internally at least, I think, like you you want to bring your personality to the table, but you also want them to take you seriously. So how do you kind of strike that balance? Yeah, well, we strike the balance by, I mean, the, the goal of every video that we produce is to have some, to help people achieve some specific outcome. It's not just to entertain them. Right. The entertainment's a layer on top. But I think, you know, if you, if you think about those different layers of, you know, um, help educating people, entertaining them, inspiring them, education is always more effective if you layer on a little bit of entertainment and a little yeah. bit of inspiration along with it. Yeah. So my last question is twofold. One is... I want to hear the worst advice you've gotten from a mentor or yeah. someone, not a mentor. I guess you wouldn't call them a mentor if they give you really bad advice, but they could. But what's I have some bad advice you've gotten? I've got a lot of bad. I think everybody gets the same bad advice because there's a lot of cliches out there. Um, you know, for example, nine out of 10 startups fail. Well, maybe nine out of 10 startups fail, but that doesn't mean you're going to fail. And that doesn't mean that nine out of 10 entrepreneurs fail, right? I think every entrepreneur has a failure story, right? As, as we've talked about. Um, but a lot of bad advice, um, let's see, things like uh, don't do business with friends. How many times have you heard that, right? Never mix business with friendship or whatever. 
Um, for me, I find that I'm just much more motivated. I have a lot more fun when I work with people who are friends. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying these are lifelong friends, but these are people that I met, got to know, became friends with, realized that we shared stuff in common, had fun going out and having a beer with, um, and then worked together, you know, subsequent to that. Um, I've found that that's a better place to start from than starting from this awkward, you know, you don't really relate to someone. Um, but you think they're a good resource or whatever. Um, another really piece of bad advice uh, is, I think, to get a stable job, stable, whatever that means. I mean, most people you know, have friends who have been laid off and you realize that this idea of a stable job doesn't really exist like it used to, but most of our parents came from a world where you tried to be loyal to a company for 30 years. Right. The average um, job span now, I think, is like around four years in the US. Um, so there is nothing, you know, really like a stable job. I think more importantly than getting a stable job is to build up some, um, you know, expertise and to be known as a person who's really good at something um, so that, you know, people pursue you. You don't have to go, you know, banging on doors looking for jobs, um, you know, stand out. Um, become known for something, specialize in something, become an expert, and then you can turn that into a business if you'd like. You can work for other people if you like. I'm, I'm really, you know, uh, whatever is best for you, you can do that. But I think the idea of just finding a stable job leads to, you know, working in a place that you don't really enjoy, not really making any progress with your career. Yeah. So I wanted to ask too, what, I know one of the biggest parts of mentorship is actually we can get from books or materials. What mentorship, what have you taken from certain books that you find important that people should check out? Well, um, one of the biggest uh, or most effective books I've read recently and, and just general concept is the idea of the lean startup. And um, this, the, you've heard of the, the term minimum viable product, MVP. Basically, the idea is that the greatest risk you're going to face as an entrepreneur is creating something that no one actually wants. And I've been through this myself. So the idea is to, you know, come up with a hypothesis around the problem that you're trying to solve, create a product as small as possible, focus on a very small core idea, and then put it out there in the world and let real customers react to it, you know, and then have those conversations that I was talking about with customers to find out what they like about it, what they don't like about it. Um, but the point is not to spend two years trying to build the perfect solution to a problem without getting any customer feedback. Um, so there's a book about this called The Lean Startup um, by Eric Ries. There's a whole lot of, there's basically an ecosystem now around lean startup concepts. Um, so Eric's book isn't the only one. There are other ones out there and there are plenty of websites that talk about lean startup and minimum viable products. Yeah. Well, Corb, I want to be the first one to thank you and in uh, relation to what you've said, um, leave a comment, ask a question, let us know <laughs> how we can help. Check out Corbett's websites, I'll link them up. And uh, thanks so much, Corbett, for taking the time today. Thanks for having me on, appreciate it.